Okay. Welcome back, everyone, to our second lecture on PC106, Interpreting Scripture. We're going to take up the questions that were put on the chat by our online students, and then we will go forward. So, let's see now. The question is, what does Mount Sinai in Arabia mean? Verse 29 says that at that time, okay, so that's one question. Then, uh, so Nina's question continues. Uh, Galatians 4.25, and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. Mount Sinai is in bondage law. Yes, corresponding to Jerusalem. What does that mean? So what Paul is doing is, uh, in uh, we're now in Galatians 4, and uh, uh, he, uh, um, the question here, Galatians 4, 24, he's talking about uh, two things, the things which are symbolic, which are the two covenants, the, uh, which we understand is the old and the new covenants. And then he talks about Mount Sinai, this is verse 24, which gives birth to bondage. So Mount Sinai is symbolic of bondage or the law. Uh, which which was represented by Hagar. So he's using Hagar to point to Mount Sinai, the law. And then verse 25, in Arabia, and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. So he's drawing a parallel. Hagar, representing bondage. Mount Sinai in Arabia, meaning Mount Sinai through which the law was given, which also is representing Jerusalem, which now is at the time of Paul's writing, Jerusalem representing Jews or Judaism, more importantly, which is representing the law being and people under bondage. So that's what he's drawing. A comparison of right you see Hagar Mount Sinai Jerusalem at that time representing uh, Jews or Judaism being in bondage so that's what he's using to represent bondage or he doesn't necessarily say old and new covenant but he that's what he's pointing to the old covenant right and uh, but verse 26 is above his free. So he's talking about heavenly Jerusalem, spiritual So that is on the other side, the contrast side, which is Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jerusalem, and later on, and he also has mentioned already in chapter 3, Christ. So that is what is of the free. So does that help understand? Uh, does it help you understand you now? Uh, Mount Sinai and Jerusalem, which now is he's talking about basically Judaism or the people under the law. The, that's what he's talking about. Or is there something more you want me to explain? Okay, I'm not sure. The other question that's on the chat is about verse 29. As he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. So the question is, uh, can you please explain about the now? Is there a relation between the persecution then and now? So the answer is yes. So what happened then? There is Hagar and Ishmael. There is Sarah and Isaac. So there was conflict between Hagar and Sarah. So Paul is referring to that. And he's saying what was of the law, or what was of the bondage, persecuted what, or what was of the flesh, persecuted what was of the spirit. That was then. And Paul says, even so, it is now. The now part, he explains in chapter 5, 
where he says, uh, chapter 5, and you know, he summarizes that in verse uh, uh, 17. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. So that's in the background. In chapter 4, he talks about that conflict. And he says, it is, that's the way it is now. Then now he explains in chapter 5, which is for all believers, where we face the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. So the flesh, that is Galatians 5, um, 17. The flesh is warring against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. So even so, it is now. That's the now he's talking about. That we who walk in the spirit, we contend against the flesh and we crucify the flesh. Right, so that's verse 24. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. So that's the now part he's talking about. So Nina and um, Jachin, did I did I answer your questions? Is it okay? Nina asked question. Jerusalem is also referred to as a heavenly Jerusalem, the free. Uh, belong there. So the bondage refers to Jerusalem. So there are two Jerusalems he's talking about. Uh, so Nina, he's talking about two Jerusalems. In verse 25, he's talking about Jerusalem, which now is, which is the earthly Jerusalem, actually speaking about the Jewish people in Jerusalem. Verse 26, he's talking about a different Jerusalem. He's talking about the Jerusalem above, the heavenly Jerusalem. So Verse 25, the Jerusalem in verse 25 is different from the Jerusalem in verse 26. The Jerusalem in verse 25 is referring to the literal city, the physical city of Jerusalem, which is basically the capital of Judaism, where um, the Jewish people are. They are under the law. They are in bondage. Verse 26 is talking about the heavenly Jerusalem, which is the people who are free. So that's the difference. So there are two different Jerusalems being referred to. Okay, fine. Judson, did you was your question answered? All right. Fine. Any questions here on Galatians? That went back to Galatians. Any questions? Sunny Prince, you have a question? Oh, okay. So Galatians is done. Galatians 4 is done. I know I didn't go into detail on that. No? On? Sorry? Okay, please ask. Um, Pastor, in line with uh, what Nina was saying, and uh, so you're telling that in verse 25 and 26, oh, it one talks... Minute, one minute, one minute. This power is not on here. Um, it just... See if it's connected in between this plug, no, this connection here. Oh, here, just, uh, or maybe that. Yeah, I was on. Thank you. Sorry, please start. So mine is on the same line as Nina's. Mm -hmm. uh, like you said, verse 25 and 26, it talks about um, two different Jerusalems. So in verse 26, um, so you mentioned that um, Jerusalem is about the people who are free now, right? And um, and they also said in the second part of it, which is the mother of us all. So what does that mean that way, mother of us all? Okay. Uh, it means it's the place where we all belong to. So you can cross-reference Hebrews chapter 12, where the church, the church, okay? Uh, so we're going a little deeper now to this thing. Uh, but Hebrews chapter 12, um, it talks about us believers, okay? And uh, this is verse 22. It's talking about us believers. It says, you have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, an innumerable company of angels, verse 23, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. So it's using many terms to talk about the church or to talk about the people who have been born again. And one of the terms you see is we are referred to, the church is referred to as 
the heavenly Jerusalem. So um, uh, the general assembly and church of the firstborn. So we are the general assembly, the church of the firstborn. So when you say, you talk about the heavenly Jerusalem, who, what, what is the heavenly Jerusalem made of? The heavenly Jerusalem is made up of us believers, born again believers. We are part of that heavenly Jerusalem. We are part of the city of God. So, so when the Bible is talking about the heavenly Jerusalem, it's it's a city, a literal city. You'll read about Revelation 22. Um, if you turn there again, cross reference. If you turn to Revelation 22, you'll see the heavenly Jerusalem coming down. Uh, uh, and let me give you the exact Revelation 21. Where is it? Yeah. Um, was verse 9 and 10 revelation 21 9 and 10 it says come revelation 21 9 and 10 come i will show you the bride the lamb's wife and he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the great city the holy jerusalem so what is that great city the heavenly jerusalem or holy jerusalem it is the lamb's bride what is that? The church. Now, there is a physical city because, you know, when he says the city comes and it, it rests on the earth, there's a physical city. He gives the measurements of it. But more important than the physical city are who's inside, the people of God, the, the church, the bride, the lamb's wife. It's using different language. So to answer your question, why is it saying heavenly Jerusalem, mother of us all? Meaning the mother is metaphorical, meaning we are all born into that city we are registered there so you have birth certificate born in jerusalem <laughs> heavenly jerusalem date of birth whatever born again you know so you are registered in that city that is your mother city but it is actually the church the lamb's wife the brides now there is a physical city it's coming like you know you read about Revelation 21 and 22 the city comes down on the earth but the people are the people who are born again believers that's what he's referring to heavenly jerusalem mother of us all okay fine sorry prince you had a question i don't... yeah question go ahead in uh proverbs uh chapter 26 verse 4 and 5 uh like... proverbs 26 4 and 5 let me let us turn there please i'll just just give me a minute Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. Proverbs 26. Proverbs 26. Huh? 26. 26. Four and, huh? 26. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 4 and 5. Okay. Like uh, here, the, like, the writer writes, like, uh, do not answer a fool according his folly, mm -hmm. lest you will be like him. Mm. And in the next verse, uh, he writes, like, answer a fool according to his folly, let's, he will be wise in his own eyes. And now, uh, as we are reading, uh, like, we we uh, have, uh, like, you told us, like, they are conveying the same meaning, but they are repeating twice. But here, it's, like, really contrast. Like, first time he tells, like, don't answer, but next time he tells, like, answer. So how we can understand this? Did you ask this question sometime back? You asked the question. Oh, so yes, somebody asked the question before. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I think the main point is don't waste your time with a with a fool. That's the main meaning. Right now it's put in two. So see, remember when Proverbs was written, it was not written in chapter and verse, like you know. So Verses uh, four and five could have been like one long sentence, but you know, in when they wrote it down, I mean, they, when they put it here, they put it in separate verses, right? But it's a perfect example of a contrast, right? So one, he's saying, yeah, you tell a fool, you speak to verse four. Oh, sorry, verse four says, don't answer. So verse four says, don't even talk to a fool; you'll be like him. Verse 5 says, you answer him. If you answer him, you make him look very wise. 
So whether you want to look like a fool or you want to make the fool look very wise. Right? So basically saying don't waste your time. Because if you talk to a fool, you'll be like him. And uh, uh, sorry, if you don't, yeah, if you talk to a fool, that is verse 5, if you talk to him, you make him feel very wise. If you, uh, uh, so don't answer him so that you don't become like him. You know, so basically ignore. So when a foolish person is talking, just let it go. Don't give any answer or let, or give any answer according his uh, foolishness and leave. Don't give any answer. Don't give any answer. Just, just ignore. Don't pay attention to it. Because you pay attention, he will think he's very wise. And you will come down to his level. Just leave him alone. Let him say what he wants. That is a meaning. But he's putting it into contrasting ways. Okay. All right. So good. Uh, let's just finish that literary styles. If um, let's go there. So we were talking about you know literary styles, and basically um, we have to handle them a little differently. Narratives are very easy. It's a story. You say why it is there. What is the meaning of that story? Simple. Get some insight. Poetry, slightly difficult because it's using pictures, images, metaphors, uh, language like that. So you have to think about it, use your imagination. And then keep in mind about this style in poetry and scripture, which is referred to as parallelism. And there are different ways it's expressed, but keep that in mind. It's saying the same thing in different ways. The last part, last style that we are saying, which is about 25% of the scriptures, is prose or discourse. So, for example, when a teacher stands here and is talking to you, what they are doing is they're giving you a discourse. They're trying to explain something to you, right? So they're not talking in poetry. <laughs> they are not. Uh, I mean, they may use a little bit of narrative. They might tell some story or something. But generally, most of the time, it's a discourse. It's a prose. It's They are trying to explain something very logically. They are trying to help you understand. So uh, prose are scripture passages that are, uh, uh, that are putting thoughts in order and trying to explain something to us so a lot of paul's writings are like that you know he is putting thought in sequence and he's trying to explain something so example if you read like we were we were dealing with the book of galatians so in the book of galatians he is trying to deal with one major problem one big problem which is how do i convince these believers who are jewish that they don't need to be under the law, but how do I explain to them? They don't need to be under the law. They are under grace. They care. They are under the Spirit. They are free. That's the main thesis of those five chapters. But in order to explain that, from chapter one, you see his thoughts. He talks about, you know, chapter one. He talks about his own life. I was born like a Jew. You know, I was born. You know, I studied under Gamaliel. All of that. But then I went through my journey and I encountered Jesus. Then chapter 2, he says, I know that some people have come to take away your freedom. So he's kind of getting close to the main point he's talk, going to address. That is, others have come and they're trying to take away your freedom. That means what has happened is there were Jewish people from Jerusalem who came to Galatia after Paul went and preached. He went away, they came, and they started confusing the people. So he's talking about them, Galatians 2. So these brethren came in, and they tried to take away your freedom. Then he starts his, like, you know, his explanation, chapter 3, about the law, 
chapter 4, like what we read about contrasting. Then chapter 5, he says, so now this is how we have to live. We have to live in the spirit. So that's how he presents his whole argument. Of course, he's being inspired by the Holy Spirit because he cannot, he has no, you know, he there is no Bible college that is teaching all this. No, it is all coming straight from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said, okay, this is the revelation they must understand. So coming from the Holy Spirit, he's writing it down. And so we can study it today and understand it, right? So that's an example of a prose, a discourse. But in that discourse, he will be quoting from the Old Testament. Uh, in this passage, there's no poetry, but, uh, you know, they, they need to understand what is he saying. It's a logical argument, right? So the prose is a little more difficult to understand because you have to follow the thought. What is he trying to say? and logically think through right and get the revelation get the truth of what is being communicated in that scripture text right? so even if you read a portion of scripture text example if somebody reads galatians chapter 3 it you 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 cannot understand you should not try to interpret it by itself you have to interpret galatians 3 in the context of verses chapters 1 and 2 and chapters 4 and 5 because it is a sequence of thoughts that are being given you understand it in its context okay so that we have to do with prose you have to handle it carefully because there's a whole sequence of thoughts he's, he's, he's giving and you have to understand it uh, in the light of what he has said before and what he will say after then you can interpret that passage correctly. You have to think logically for that. All right. So, in uh, most books, in most books of the Bible, you'll find a combination, right? Sometimes there will be uh, narratives, stories. For example, in Galatians, Paul talks about his own life. He says, I was in the deserts of Arabia for 14 years. He's talking a little bit about his own life. He says, I mean, I went to Jerusalem. I was there for 14 days. Nobody met me except Peter and John. So it's a little narrative about his own life. Then there is, uh, there's no poetry there. Yeah. But there is that a lot of prose. I mean, a lot of logical thought he gives. Okay. So in every Bible, every book of the Bible, you'll find a combination of these literary styles. Okay, so is it clear? These three things, very simple. Narrative, poetry, prose. They have to be handled slightly differently as you read in the Bible. Last chapter, I mean, uh, last before the final chapter. Uh, let me see any questions online before I go to this last chapter. Any questions from online students? Any? hope all of you are following me. Uh, we will do a summary of everything, you know, uh, before we get in. Uh, it's the last one. Okay. So this is the last chapter. And then after this, we are going to uh, practice, which is uh, we're going to deal with difficult chapters in the Bible. That's next chapter 15. So in this chapter, chapter 14, this is a sum some summation of everything, meaning... The whole objective in biblical interpretation is how do you apply the word of God correctly? So when you go and preach, don't say this word, Hebrew word means that, this Hebrew word means that, this is the culture, this is the history, fine. But what does it mean to me today? If you tell me Hebrew word means that, that, and those days that was the culture and that was the language, okay, fine. How does it apply today? If you somebody comes to eat, you say, this is chili powder, <laughs> this is salt, <laughs> this is mutton, raw mutton, this is uh, rice, enjoy. How will they enjoy? 
no application right so it is important to have chili powder and <laughs> all that but then you have to put it together you have to cook it uh, and you have to make it edible it has to benefit the people it has to be food that will bless their body otherwise it is only uh, raw ingredients it will not be of any use nobody can eat salt lot of salt you can't do that so while everything we have said before is important you cannot just present that to people and say take it no use the goal is you have to tell people how to apply the word so these first 13 lessons you have to do in private you do by yourself in your when you are studying the word of god maybe one or two thoughts you will bring public you know everything that is not right. the point is after you've done that study you've gone through the you know you've exercised all this in private when you're studying your bible you understood it then you say okay this is how this scripture applies to everyday life that is what you want to serve you want to serve the cooked food you don't want to serve them here yeah, this raw ingredients no use you have to serve the cooked food you have to show them how to apply the word of god what is the problem in everyday life how to apply it how to live it that is very important so the whole objective of studying and interpreting and analyzing is so that when you speak to people you give them the finished result of your study that is this is how you apply the word of god in your everyday life now i want to tell you one simple thing the more simple you can make it the better it is it means you have really understood when you speak if it is so complicated nobody understands it means you also have not understood really if somebody is speaking it is so complicated you can be sure he has not understood that's why it is so complicated but when somebody is speaking and say it's so simple it means the person has understood it so well he can make it simple for you so a good teacher takes the complicated and makes it simple a bad teacher takes the simple and makes it complicated finished okay so keep that in your mind if you want to be a good teacher you should be able to take the complicated and make it simple people understand ah that's it yeah but actually to understand the complicated you studied you went through the thinking and you understood it so well you can make it put it simple words few words okay so keep this in mind right so you do your hard work you study you understand it but when you speak it to people make it simple they'll understand right so that is our goal and they have to apply it in their life right it's not just knowing the hebrew the greek and the culture okay put it in your how will you practice it so here's what Ma martin luther said right he said the bible is not merely to be repeated or known but to be lived and felt i mean you got to live it you have to feel the practice of the word of god in our lives so the the application of god's word uh, is the objective of interpretation now of course uh, the reason we i want to interpret correctly is so that the scriptures can be applied correctly if you misinterpret it and you tell that to people uh, it can hurt them they may do something wrong right so that's why you have to interpret it correctly you tell them the correct meaning they will apply it correctly they'll be fine okay so uh, when you are giving the application some guidelines of course that's what we've been telling all along interpret correctly 
and then apply the word of God. Right? So, example. Suppose you take Luke 14, 26 and 27. Jesus said, if you don't forsake your father and mother, wife and children, Luke 14, 26, 27. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, Luke 14, 26. Then he says, see, you have to hate your father and your mother and your wife. And... You can take this scripture. This scripture. And you say, you have to hate your father. You have to hate your mother. You have to hate your wife. And only then you can be a disciple. So then people here, they go home, they fight. <laughs> fight with their father, mother, wife, children, everybody. Because hey, it says you have to hate. I'm being a disciple of Jesus. But is that the correct interpretation? We are reading the verse. Yes, we are reading it. But the verse has to be interpreted along with other verses about family, along with other verses on family relationships. It cannot be interpreted by itself. If you just explain by itself, uh, it will go wrong. It will cause problems in people's homes. Right? So, you, of course, you know, the Bible also says, Husbands, love your wives. Wives, love your husbands. Respect them. Children, honor your parents. Parents, don't mistreat your children. All those things are in the Bible. So, we cannot take this one verse, Luke 14, 26, by itself and give it to people. When we explain this verse, we have to explain it along with other scriptures. See? Otherwise, the application can go wrong. People can get into problems, trouble. Number two, understand progressive revelation. That means, if you read something, uh, we, have, we have explained all this, but now we're just putting it together. If you read something in the Old Testament or somewhere, then you think, okay, what else has been said about this afterwards? And follow the most current example. Old Testament, God said, keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath day is holy. So it is there. You have so many scriptures in the Old Testament. But it's one of the Ten Commandments. Keep the Sabbath because the Sabbath is holy. See, we are all, every week, we are all breaking the Ten Commandments. Because we don't keep the Sabbath. Sabbath is seventh day, last day of the week. We are doing our own thing. But you come to, so then you say, see, you're all break, we're all breaking Sabbath. Then you come to the New Test. Then you understand. Jesus said, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You are more important than the particular day of the week. Not this Saturday. It could be any day. The point is you rest. And then, New Testament, they started meeting on the first day of the week. Because that was the resurrection day, the day the Lord rose up. So it's, oh, New Testament church, something has changed. Right? Then Paul writes very explicitly, right? Colossians 2, we don't keep the Sabbath. Very clear. We don't observe days, Romans 14. Uh, Romans, Romans 14. We don't observe days uh, and those things. We don't observe it. So you keep whatever day you want. Oh, so New Testament things have changed. So what must we preach? Preach current truth. Preach present truth. So that's what he says in 2 Peter 1. If you look at 2 Peter 1 and verse 12, Peter says, present truth. We must preach and teach present truth. That means the revelation has brought us to this place. Second Peter 1.12. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, 
though you know and are established in the present truth the present truth things have god has given more 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 truth present truth what is the present truth you have to be established in the present truth meaning i'm talking about the bible but in the bible things have you know evolved god has changed and what is the last thing god said that's the present truth so certain things you know i, I just use sabbath as an example number 3 stay with the well understood do not let obscure and difficult passages override what is clear and obvious. So, example. Job, you know, example, the book of Job. People worry. Job, hedge of protection. Why did God remove that hedge of protection? What if God removes that hedge of protection from you? So I worry about that. Job's hedge of protection, devil attacked him. What if God takes away your hedge? Of hey, that was Job before the cross. You're not living in Job's time. You and I are living in a different time. What is the time we are living in? At least two big things. One. The devil has been defeated. The cross has happened. Christ has come. Job lived way before the cross. You and I are living way after the cross. But the devil has been defeated. Big difference. Job didn't have the name of Jesus. He didn't have the blood of Jesus. He knew nothing. He didn't have any scripture. Second difference. You and I have the full armor of God. Job had no knowledge of the armor of God. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, put on the full armor of God, but if God removes the hedge, you're gone case. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, put on the full armor of God, and you can stand against the devil. Finished. Hedge or no hedge, I'm not dependent on the hedge. God has given me a full armor. And he told me to put it on. And he said, if you put on the full armor, you will quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. I'm not dependent on some hedge. God has given me the full armor. So it's a big difference from Job and you. So believers are wasting time. Oh, what about Job's hedge, Job's hedge, Job's hedge? You've got an armor. Right? So if somebody goes and preaches the sermon, sermon title, Hedge of Protection. And they preach from Job chapter 1. So, we are living in a different time. I don't need a hedge of protection. God gave me the armor to wear. That's my protection. Different time. So understand that. you know, And don't make those kinds of mistakes where we are preaching something that is not relevant to where we are in God's program, what God has done for His people. So stay with what's well understood, what God has clearly done. Number four, Jesus Christ. See, Jesus is the Word who became flesh. The eternal Word who became flesh. So He's perfect. Perfect. Some people say, oh, look, there is some problem here in that scripture text. Some, and we will look at this in the next chapter. We'll compare some passages. Uh, look, there's a problem here. There's a problem there. Okay. Look at Jesus. He's perfect. No problem of comma, full stop, dash. He is the word who became flesh. Look at his life. This is perfect. Don't worry about all this grammar, this, that. What do you see in the life of Jesus? He is the Word who became flesh. He is God revealed to us. So we want to understand God, look at the life of Jesus. So sometimes there may be passages, there may be other things that may, we may not have answers. 
Okay, don't worry. Look at Jesus. Whatever you see in the life of Jesus, we can live by that. Whatever you learn from the teachings of Jesus, we can live by that. Even if you don't understand some other passages, don't worry. He is the Word who became flesh. So ultimately, focus on that. Okay. Number five. Um, this is just practical thing. So when you're bringing the application, talk about things which people are dealing in their lives. How do you apply the Word of God to what problems people are facing today? Example. Addiction to mobile phones. So where is that in the Bible? Mobile phones were not there during Bible times. So it is not written in the Bible. But we can take the scripture. How to overcome the desires, the sinful desires of the flesh. And apply that to this problem. Which is in this exam. I'm just giving an example. Addiction to you know, social media, phones, mobile phones, what? I'm not saying don't use the phone. I use the phone. But I'm not addicted to it. I can leave it aside and I, I don't have to check it. I'm fine. I don't get nervous breakdown. <laughs> I need my phone. <laughs> what happened? No, I'm fine without my phone. But some people are not like that. No. So studies have shown, especially young people, they cannot be without their phone more than 30 minutes. They get separation anxiety. They are separated from the phone. 30 minutes. What happened on my phone? The world has fallen apart. Really, this is, you know, young people. It's a problem. So we have to address real problems by taking the scripture, applying it in that situation. Right? So that is point number five, right? Understand. Understand the people, understand what they're going through. Then, with God's wisdom and revelation, take the scriptures and apply it to the real problems that people are facing. That will be very meaningful. Otherwise, you give them Hebrew and Greek and all this. Oh, so what? How will it help me overcome my problem? But does the Bible have answer? Yeah. Bible has answers. For everything, there's answer. But we have to take the scriptures and address different uh, situations people are going. That particular situation may not be, it will not be in the Bible because the times are different. But the truth of the Bible can be applied to every situation. That is our responsibility. Okay. And. Uh, Number six, uh, understand the principle. Okay. And understand the principle that is in the text. And then we apply it to, or we provide an answer based on the principle. We will come to this. Uh, I've given here in point number six, I've given the example of tithing. And uh, we will come back to this because in, in the ne next chapter, one of the questions is, should believers tithe or to should New Testament people tithe? One of the questions. Some people argue, oh, tithing is only in the Old Testament. You don't find it in the New Testament. Well, we have to look at scripture. We'll look at scripture. So that's kind of what I've mentioned here. I've given the scriptures here. Um, and we will come back to this when we answer the question. So the, the important thing is look at the principle that is involved. So in one of the lessons, we talked about practices and principles. There may be a practice which is under the Old Testament. But what is the principle? Like example, washing the feet. We don't practice washing the feet, 
But what is the principle? Serve one another in love, serve one another in humility. That's the principle. The principle still continues. Right? I'm, we know may not be going and washing people's feet. So like that, when you read the scriptures, with the help of God, see the principle. What is the principle? And then you make it relevant to people. This is how you can apply it in your life, how you can live by this principle. Then it will make the scripture relevant, meaningful. Okay, so take the principle, share the principle. This is how, well, this is what you can do. This is what you can practice. Okay, and uh, just last two points here uh, write out specific actions. That means what can people do? Tell them this is what you can do practically. You know? So sometimes, um, if we don't get down to point seven, that is, we don't tell them this is what you can do, they may not be able to make the connection they may, may not be able to think about that so you know you need to tell them this is what you're going to one two three this is what you can do oh okay yeah. so when you're when you usually start with interpretation you give the application and one of the best ways to give the application is to give them action this is what you can do action this is what you can do then they will understand okay from the scriptures, this is how I can live my everyday life. And for this, of course, we have to de depend on the Holy Spirit. How to, you know how to do that? Okay. So we'll pause here. Uh, sorry, we didn't have time for questions. Let's see now. Let me see if there are any questions online. Okay. Any questions from the online class on this? App applying the word. Okay, so from next week, right, I think we'll take a couple of classes. Uh, that, that is lesson number 15. We're going to deal with difficult passages or difficult concepts. Right? So we'll put all this together and then we'll deal with it. So for example, we'll start off by talking about uh, uh, the Trinity. Uh, no, is Jesus God? So some theological question. Is Jesus God? Then the Trinity, how do you explain the Trinity? Okay. And then some will get into some practical questions, like can example, some of the questions will do, can women teach and teach the word of God? Uh, are women allowed to be in fivefold ministry? You know, those things, because people, those are questions that people argue, theological questions. So we look at those difficult passages and all that. Uh, we'll try to cover as much, but there will be some portions I won't cover, like is it okay for a believer to have tattoos or not? I'll just, you know, I will, I will put the question, I'll put the thing that you can read it, it's simple. Yeah. So there will be those, those practical things. Um, so basically that's the last chapter, you know, those difficult questions that keep coming. I will do that, and that will be done with the course, okay? And then I'll make sure you get the full course notes. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, we can discuss. Let's close. Father, we thank you for this time of learning. And uh, we just pray that all of us uh, will be guided by your Holy Spirit, with wisdom from the Holy Spirit, to handle your word correctly. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you. We can take a break. See you.